available everywhere. Hello, everyone, and welcome back into the GSMC Fantasy Sports Podcast. Before we jump into our uh, fourth segment here of the day, I got a comment from Shep Easy Sweet Spot that I want to highlight. Please wave Adams. I'll jump all over him. Well, it's kind of your funeral at that point, you know, taking a risk on Adams. I feel like, you know, his best bet is with New York, but it's just so, I can't get over the fact that it's so controlling of an environment that I don't know if you can really implement Adams into this team amidst this kind of tension and dysfunctionality, even when he's perhaps the receiver that can calm Aaron Rodgers down the most if he goes there. So it's going to be an interesting situation either way. But I want to get into my tight end positional ranks because this is the position that has been the most volatile these past couple of weeks. And these four guys that have accumulated all have the ability to week in, week out, be guys that are in the top five at the end of the respective weeks. But since no one's really separating themselves in the tight end pack early in the season as Sheppy Sweet Up must as I don't much as I don't enjoy Rogers reuniting with Adams and they will produce. I think that there is kind of prevailing sentiment in that statement, but at the end of the day, it's a different environment they're in now. Where where they were in Green Bay it didn't necessarily matter on a nationwide scale whether or not they produced. Now the questions will be asked of them if they don't. And that's the difference. And I get that, you know, Aaron Rodgers and Devontae Adams make magic happen together. And it's something we haven't often seen. But in the New York market, where instant gratification matters... If anything were to go awry, if Adams were to go there, they would be crucified together. And a lot of people would then be questioning this mid-season firing of Sala, even, even as terrible as he's been. If everything goes awry, and I think it can with that trade, then don't shoot the messenger. But I do want to get into the tight end segment here. Because all four of these guys compiled, like I said, week in, week out, can be top one, two, three, four, five, or they can fall out of the top ten completely. Without further ado, let's jump right into this first segment of the day. The first one is always a guy who's having a breakout season. It might just be a sneaky guy going forward who could be in the tight end one conversation come year's end, and that is Isaiah Likely. Going up against the Commanders in perhaps the marquee game of the week. 16.3 fantasy points against Cincinnati. Catching that touchdown on that incredible all-world play by Lamar Jackson. Just proving to be perhaps the biggest security blanket for any AFC team in terms of the value he adds at the tight end position for the Baltimore Ravens. Because I feel like the Ravens receiving group is very limited in terms of the route tree, but also the fact that this offense is more tailored to what Lamar Jackson can do out of structure than in it. And that nest, that, and that kind of benefits Isaiah Likely a bit more than it would most tight ends because if you can just find a way to f- get open, sit in the seam, like a Travis Kelsey or something, like he always does, the chances are you're going to see a lot of targets as a tight end. And that's what Isaiah Likely is doing now. And... Not for nothing, everyone thought Mark Andrews was going to be that guy, but I feel like Isaiah Likely has made this role his own. And I feel like he's going to become the more physical of the two. He's going to become the more reliable of the two going forward. And it seems weird to say, but he's looking to be perhaps one of the more premier tight end options in fantasy as well. And this game is going to be very important. In breaking down, yes, a very suspect commander's defense, but who knows? Maybe they up the ante as the opponents get tougher. So it's all going to depend on different X factors for both teams, and Isaiah likely certainly going to be one of them. And I love the fantasy value he adds in this matchup. 
And the second guy I'm picking, Pat Fryermuth, the guy we haven't talked about that much since the start of the year. Going up against the Las Vegas Raiders. Had a pretty decent game against Dallas this past week. And not for nothing, I kind of feel like, you know, in this Steelers skill position room, you have guys who, you know, are reminiscent of what you want out of a Steelers offense. And Pat Fryermuth perhaps is the guy most embodying that sentiment. And going up against the Las Vegas Raiders, another team that's getting a little bit more dysfunctional as we go along. I feel like Pat Fryermuth's value stems from the fact that the Raiders' run defense might want to key in on, you know, limiting what Justin Fields can do. And so, if we see a lot of what we actually saw in that game against Dallas, where Justin Fields is using short to intermediate passes to kind of settle down, change the tempo of the game, then Pat Frymouth is going to be a big part of that offensive game script. And so, that's why I like the value here. Going with such a defense that still is very tough, but has its holes in it, and just being able to exploit what the Raiders think you're going to do. And just be the guy who gets reliable yardage for your team. That's why Pat Farmer has a lot of fantasy value this week. Then the next guy, guy who has had a kind of topsy-turvy start to his season. Dealing with injuries. Now coming off this bye, hopefully fully healthy. Going up against... A defense, like I said, very similar to the Cow- to the Raiders, actually, in that they can be a solid defense, but with all their injuries and, you know, different storylines about them, they are very weak. And the Cowboys, Sam Laporta is going to have a big game. And not for nothing, you know, I kind of feel like even though that Lions offensive performance against Seattle, everyone kind of contributed, Sam Laporta... When he's healthy, you'll see he's going to get the lion's share of the targets. When, you know, Jared Goff is back to pass, which might be less often this season, but it's something that when it happens, he's always going to look for Sam Laporta. Yes, the same can be said of Amon Ross St. Brown, but that's how this balance works. And it's how Ben Johnson has created the versatility in this offense we're all very familiar with. And so, when I look at Sam Laporta in this matchup, and I look at how limited the Cowboys are right now with their injuries, both in the secondary and the linebacker position, especially with Micah Parsons, you know, you also lost to Marcus Lawrence up front. You can attack them all over the field at your will if you're the Lions. The Lions perhaps have had sneakily two of the easier defensive matchups over the past couple of weeks. In Seattle, they knew that Seattle's run defense was banged up and they couldn't handle the volume of running they were doing. And they were also able, with that, to pepper in different routes that exploited the back end of the Seattle deck secondary. They were able to get beyond the second level. I feel like it's going to be a similar story in this game. Because the Cowboys are terrible at stopping the run, but they're also average at best at kind of limiting the damage control in terms of when teams open up the passing game against them. So it's going to be a game where Sam Laporte is going to be a tactical chess piece that gets moved around a lot and in many different ways is going to be a chameleon for this offensive game script. Then the last guy had a pretty down game this past week, going into a very important divisional game this week of Monday night, I believe, against the Jets. This guy really is going to stand out. And that is Dalton Kincaid, another guy in my team. Going up against the, going up against the, J- the Jets, sorry. I put the Jags in my uh, graphic here, so sorry about the little mix-up. Going up to the Jets. I feel like The thing with Dalton Kincaid is that do they trust him more with, you know, the injuries and questions about the receiving core if, you know, a guy like Shakira Coleman goes down? Or 
if you know he goes down, we see a higher volume of Josh Allen to Khalil Shakir and Keon Coleman passes, even if he were to come back. That's the question. Because I don't necessarily know if Kincaid's value in this offense outweighs the value that they're trying to have with guys like Shakir and Coleman. But against the Jets, I kind of feel like Kincaid's going to be the matchup nightmare for this Jets defense. Because he's going to be someone who, sneakily enough, will extend the field far more than perhaps their other weapons that they have. And that's saying something because as a tight end, all you really have to do is find the holes in the coverage of the defense and just try and get open to the best of your abilities. You're not the explosive play guy. But Dalton Cade feels different in a certain way because of the limitations excuse me, of this room. And so that's the question that they have to answer. But let me know what you think in the comments about this game script for all these tight ends. But coming next, right on the other side of this quick break, I'm going to be talking about my weekly shadow report to close out the show, my key wide receiver cornerback matchups that will define this week in fantasy football. You don't want to miss it. We'll be right back after this short break.